Okay, so we're gonna, this is part two of five one. Yesterday we did the graphing, which we'll do a quick review of in the beginning. And then we're gonna get into the one-to-one -one property. Did we do five together? No, okay. So I'm gonna start with the same values. I'm gonna plug in negative one, zero, and one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go back to it. One, four to the negative one would be four. One fourth to the zero would be one. And one fourth to the first would be one fourth. So negative one, four, zero, one, and one and one fourth. There's no vertical asymptote on this. I mean, there's no vertical shift on this which would happen if I added or subtracted something after the exponent, which means my horizontal asymptote is at y equals zero. And then I know I get my curve as close to the asymptote as possible without touching it. My domain is all real numbers because that's the case for every exponential graph. My range is zero to positive infinity and my y-intercept is zero, one. You can get it from the graph or you can get it from the middle point of your T-chart. It's zero unless there's a vertical shift. If there's a vertical shift, then it is wherever that vertical shift is. So if I added three to the end of this, it's at y equals three. If I subtracted three to the end of it, then it's at y equals negative three. Yep, you're welcome. All right, so similar to five would be six. It starts as a fraction, so when I plug in my values, they have the same effect. If I plug in negative one, I get 10. If I plug in zero, I get one. And if I plug in one, I get one tenth. Negative one and 10, two, four, six, eight, 10, zero and one and one and one tenth. Horizontal asymptote did not shift because there's no vertical asymptote. I mean, there's no vertical shift. So this one's just steeper. Everything else is the same. Domain is the same, range is the same, y-intercept's the same, and horizontal asymptote. Okay, so what's the difference in the transformations between 11 and 12? And in the exponent, it does what? Horizontal. Yep, in the exponent, you said vertical. You were right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. In the, in the exponent, it's horizontal, right? And in the exponent, it's horizontal, and we go the opposite way our brain thinks. So that's a shift to the right, too. I don't really care because I'm going to plug in values, but what that is important is that my horizontal asymptote did not move. That's what that tells me. Whereas in 12, the plus 3 after, that's a vertical shift, and that tells me my asymptote does move. Okay, that's the difference between those two. As far as the value goes, I think, I think it's just as easier to plug in your coordinate points for both. You could have plotted just like y, four to the x and then shifted it. On the bottom, it would shift a right to, on, the, on 12, it would shift it up three. But you can also just get your coordinate points by plugging in. So I would get four to the negative one minus two, four to the zero minus two, and four, <clears throat> excuse me, to the one minus two. So four to the negative third is one over 64. The negative bumps it to the bottom and four to the third is 64. Four to the negative second is one over 16. And four to the negative first is one fourth. Because there's no vertical shift, I know my horizontal asymptote is at zero. And what's tricky about this is because that shift happens, my coordinate points are so close together vertically. Like 0 0.64, 0 0.16, and 0 0.14 barely move. 
So what you have to know is that at some point it kicks up and goes up. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you can't just make it a little line on the bottom. What you also can do is as it's increasing to the right, I can plug in some extra points. So let's say I plugged in two. Four to the two minus two would be four to the zero, which is one. So now I know I'm coming up a little bit. Four to the three minus two would be four to the first, which is four. And now I know I start to come up there. So if you're unsure of your graph, you can always plug in some extra points. As long as you knew to eventually turn that up and come up, it didn't have to be perfect, especially if it gives you the values to plug in. So from the graph, I know, well, from any exponential function, domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Range, because it didn't shift up or down, is zero to positive infinity. And my y-intercept is the place where it crosses the y-axis, which is where I plug in zero, zero and one-sixteenth. That would have been harder to get if I shifted it left to right. If I had plotted the original and then shifted it, you would have ended up plugging in zero anyways. All right, so with 12, it's important that there's a positive or there's a vertical shift, whether it's up or down. That shifts my horizontal asymptote. So as soon as I see that, I know my horizontal asymptote is at y equals 3. So I know there's a line there. It's going to shift everything up. So that affects my range too. The rest I can get from my t-chart. So 4 to the negative 1 plus 3. 4 to the 0 plus 3, and 4 to the 1st plus 3. That's 1 fourth plus 3, or 3 and 1 fourth. That's 1 plus 3, or 4. And that's 4 plus 3, or 7. So negative 1, 3 and a fourth, 0, 4, and 1, 7. Domain is still all real numbers. Range shifts up to 3 to positive infinity. And my y-intercept, the center point on my t-chart or from my graph, 0, 4. questions on those. We're going to pick up with the one-to-one -one property. So the one-to-one -one property just says basically that if I have two exponential expressions set equal to each other, if I can get their bases to be the same, then I can set their exponents to be the same. So we will take two sides of an equation, something like two to the x equals, I don't know, like eight. And your goal is to get them to be the same base. So I would not change the smaller. You're usually changing the bigger. So I would rewrite 8 as a power of 2. So 2 to the x would equal 2 to the third because that's what 8 is. And then I would get x equals 3. They are obviously not all that simple, but that's the general concept. You're going to change the base so they are the same. And then you set the, the, um, two equa the two exponents equal to each other. And you can totally ignore the base at that point. Remember that raising anything to the power of zero is one because that's going to come up in today's stuff. All right, so looking at 15, I've got nine equals three to the x plus one. So we're going to rewrite which one? The nine. We're going to change nine to be a power of three. Nine is three to what power? To three to the second. So I would get three to the second equals three to the x plus one. And as soon as those bases are the same, I ignore the bases and set the x when it's equal to each other. 2 would equal x plus 1, subtract the 1, and x equals 1. That's it. You can easily plug these back into check sometimes. So like if I plug back in the 1, I'd get 3 to the 1 plus 1, which is 2, and that's 9. Left side equals right side. Then we go to 16, and 16 
The left side has the fraction, the right side has an 8. So, so how do I make 1 half 2 to a power? What causes something to move from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top? A negative exponent. So 2 would be raised to the negative 1, and that's the equivalent of 1 half. And then the 8, we just said, was 2 to the 3rd. When we raise a power to a power, we multiply. So this becomes negative x, and then the bases are the same. So I set negative x equal to 3, and x would be negative 3. And again, an easy check here. If I plug that in there, 1 half to the negative 3, the negative brings the 2 to the top, and then 2 to the third would be 8, and left side would equal right side. Question so far? Okay, go to 17. This time I'm changing which one? 8, so 8 becomes 2 to the 3rd again, would equal 2 to the 2x minus 1. The bases are the same, so we ignore them and set the exponents equal to each other. And then I solve for x, so I add the 1, 4 would equal 2x, divide by 2, and x equals 2. We won't check every time, but you could check it. You could plug it back in. It would be 4 minus 1, which is 3, and 2 to the 3rd is 8. All right, 18. What would be the base that they would have in common? Three. three. So how do I make one third become three to a power? How do I get it to move to the top? Three. Negative. So three to the negative one raised to the negative x would equal 27 is three to the third. If you don't remember, 27 is 3 and 9 and 3 and 3, and there are 3 of them. Okay. All right, so then I would multiply these out. Negative 1 times x is x equals, grab this exponent, and x is 3. So remember, when we raise the power to power, we multiply. For 19, we'd move 3 to the top by making it negative 1, still raised to the x, and then 81 is 4 threes. It would be 9 and 9, and then each of them would be 2 threes. So 3 to the 4th. And I'd get, multiply that out, negative x equals 4, and x equals negative 4. And go to 20. Which one am I changing? The 8. So 2 stays as 2 to the x plus 4. 8 becomes 2 to the 3rd, and then that is raised to the x minus 6. So be careful here, because that 3 then has to get distributed to both the x and the minus 6, and those are common mistakes made only doing it to the x. So I'd get x plus 4 equals 3x minus 18. It's always the bigger one. Yeah, but unless it's a fraction. Obviously, the fractions we move. But it's always the bigger one because you can't rewrite 2. I mean, you can, but it's awful. It would be a, a fraction. 2 to a certain power, right? You'd rather rewrite the big one. So then I subtract the x, and I get 4 equals 2x minus 18. Add the 18. And I get 2x equals 22. Divide by 2. And x is 11. And again, you can check it. I could plug it back in. I'd get 11 plus 4, and then I'd get 8 to the 11 minus 6. But that, I would say, I would want a calculator because you're dealing with 8 to the 5th power, right? So if you had the calculator to check it, that would be easy. If not, the numbers get pretty big. We still good? All right. You, let's skip set. We'll, we'll trade. We'll save 21 for Monday. Let's go to 22. Which one are you going to change? 25. So 25 becomes what? Good. 5 to the second. The bases are the same. So we grab the exponents. 
2x plus 1 equals 2, 2x equals 1, and x equals 1 half. Twenty-three. Your base is e. Okay, it is still just a base, so it's a base. It's like a two point seven, but it's just the base. And it, since it's already the same there, you can just grab the exponents here. So I would get four to the x minus one equals two times x. Again, when we raise a power to a power, we multiply, and I would subtract the four x. Negative one equals negative two x. Divide by negative 2, and x is 1 half. For 24, which one are we going to change? It's actually a trick question because you have to change them both, right? You can't raise 9 to a power to get to 27, but they do have a common base, and that is 3. So if you don't see it right away, break it apart into its product of its primes, and you'll see it. Like 27 would have 3 threes, 9 would have 2. So I would know 27 would be 3 to the third, and it's still raised to the 4x. So we're going to end up multiplying those out. Wait for it. And then 9 would be 3 to the second raised to the x plus 1. And again, you would have to multiply those out. So then I'd get 3 times 4x, which is 12x, equals 2 times x plus 1. That 2 is going to both, so 2x plus 2. Subtract the 2x, 10x equals 2, divide both sides by 10, and x is 2 over 10, or 1 fifth. Questions on that one? Okay, so 26, both has e's, but they're both in the bottom. So I want to bring them both to the top first. How do I bring the e to the top in the first side? And make it a negative 1. So it would be e to the negative 1 raised to the negative x. And then if I bring this to the top, it's e to the negative 2 raised to the x plus 1. So the negative brings it to the top. Multiply out your exponents on either side. And I get positive x equals the negative 2 to both. Negative 2x minus 2. Add the 2x. 3x equals negative 2 divide by 3. And x is negative 2 thirds. All of these will get kept exact, so you won't put like a rounded answer for any of these. They'll all be kept exact. Because so far we haven't needed our calculator. Questions on those? Okay. Now we get into fractional exponents. So look at 27. What is it as an exponent if it's a square root? Do you remember? No. So the square root is the same thing as raising something to the one half because the two slides over to become the index, right? And the exponent drops down. So the square root of two is actually two to the one half. If it was a cube root, one third. If it was a fourth root, one fourth. And then on the left side, that's being raised to the x plus 4 because we're going to multiply those out. And on the right side, I can rewrite 4 as 2 squared, and that would be raised to the x power. And then I grab the exponents, and I grab the exponents here, and I'd get 1 half times x and 1 half times 4 equals 2 times x. Now, if you're awful at fractions from here, you can multiply everything by 2 and get rid of it. So I can that would look like this. Multiply everything by 2. I'd get x plus 4 equals 4x. Subtract the x. 4 equals 3x. Divide by 3. And x is 4 thirds. If you're not awful at fractions, you can also just take this. Subtract the 1 half x. 2 would equal, this is 4 halves x minus 1 half x, which is 3 halves x. And then I'd multiply by the reciprocal to get rid of that fraction. 
and you get four thirds. So either way, you could do it either way. Whatever you're the most comfortable with, stick with it. 28, that's actually a B, it's not a six. It tends to throw people just because of the font, but that's a B, that's your variable. So how can I get 27 to go to the top? Negative one, and then I need to make it have, no, I'm, that's a line, wait, hang on. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, now I need to change it so that it has a base, right? So this time we're reversing it. You, and I'll show you a different way to do this too, but we're reversing it. The base has the variable on it now, so I want to see, can I rewrite it so that the exponents would be the same? So can I give 27 a power of three? Yes, it would be three to the third, right? So three to the negative third would equal B to the negative third. And now the exponents are the same, so I can say the bases would be the same. So you're reversing it. You could also have taken this from the beginning and moved the B. So I could say one over 27 equals one over B to the third. I can cross multiply and cube root. So either way, however your brain sees that, it's the reverse of what we were doing before. Before you had to change the basis to be the same, but what if the exponents are the same? You can also use it that way. So from here, I would have said B to the third equals 27 and then cube root 27 and I'd get three. So again, you choose whichever way connects to your brain, hopefully one of those ways too, but whichever way your brain sees it, you can use it. All right, so then we've got our fractional exponents that doesn't have a one in the top, okay? If I wanna get rid of the two thirds there because I can't change, I'm not gonna change the basis to be the same and I'm not gonna change the exponents to be the same. Like there's nothing I wanna raise four to to make it two thirds. A way I could get rid of this is by cube or do, raising it to the three halves. So if I raise it to the reciprocal, it cancels it out because two thirds times three halves would be one. So I'm gonna do the same thing here, three halves. And I get R equals, the two becomes the index. So this is the square root of four raised to the third power. What's the square root of four? Two and two to the third, eight. I would say I would check these two, like double check, is the cube root of eight to the second power four Cube root of eight is two, and two to the fourth is four. People tend to make mistake with those exponents, so just be careful. You're raising it to the reciprocal. Yep. If there wasn't a way to simplify the square root of four. You would leave it like that, but it should be able to be simplified. So you would leave it as the root raised to the power. Yeah, which usually it will be able to be simplified. All right, so remember we talked about E yesterday. E is called the natural base. We're going to see it a lot in the next four sections because we're going to continue to use it for logs. E is 2.71828, blah, 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 da, 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 da. And the formula that leads you to get to E is an, an, it's just an exponential growth formula. So as things grow exponentially, the higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher the value you plug in, the smaller the change ends up being. Because as I raise this power to a 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 power, to a power the, the smaller change happens and that change ends up causing what's called a limit, okay? As it approaches infinity, it actually gets closer and closer to the, what they call E, which is the natural base. You don't ever have to derive it. You'll hear about limits when we get, when we get to pre-calc. There's plenty of that later, okay? What you need to understand is that this is the formula you would actually use if you had um, like an interest and it was compounded annually. So if I was compounding something and we're gonna change it a little bit, but if I was taking something that was getting earning 100% interest or something like that, that would be what my formula would be. What we're gonna use is this second one because our rate is gonna be changing, our number of times a year is gonna be changing, and the time in that investment is gonna be changing. So P times one plus R over N to the NT is your formula. Does anybody remember seeing this? Because my child is learning this right now and I did not know they learned it in Algebra One Honors. Yeah. Like nuts. Okay, 
So P is your principal value. This is how much money you're putting into an account. T is the number of years it sits in that account. R is your rate and it has to be in decimal. So when I get something like 3.2%, how do I convert that to decimal? Move the decimal two places to the left, good. So this would be 0 0.032. So that's gonna happen every single time. It's gonna give you the rate in percent. You're gonna have to bump it back two places to get the, de the decimal. N is the number of times a year compounding. So if it says that this is, is an annual compounding, that's once a year, semi-annual, twice a year, quarterly, four times a year, monthly, 12 times a year, weekly, 52 times a year, daily, 365 times a year, okay? Weekly is something people tend to like freak out when they see it. It's 50, there's 52 weeks in a year, okay? So those things you have to know because it will be almost in word problem form. And then A is how much money would be at the end of that year, of all those years, okay? These questions look like this. If you're investing $12,000 at an annual rate of 3%, find the balance after five years if it's compounded quarterly. So again, A equals P times one plus R over N to the N T. P, principal balance, how much money you invested. That's 12,000. All right, one obviously stays as one. If my rate is 3%, what is that in decimal? Zero point zero. Good. So point zero 0.03 goes in my numerator. Number of times a year. So if it's quarterly, how many times is that a year? Four times a year. And then it's raised to the number of times a year, so the four times the number of years, which in this case is five. Now this is where you need to know your calculator because they all operate a little bit differently. If you have one of the graphing utilities, you can type that whole sucker in all at once. So I could do 12,000, open my parentheses, one plus 0 0.03 divided by four, raise to the four times five. Like I literally could type the whole thing in at once and it looks like this. Okay, I literally can type it all in at once like that. Hit enter and I get $13,934.209. This is money. So we round to the nearest hundredth and that nine bumps the zero up. So $13,934.21. If you are using like the iPhone calculator or the iPad calculator, like the simplistic one, it's harder because you're gonna have to, where'd the five go? You're gonna have to Take the 0 0.03, divide it by four, then add it to the one, then raise it to the 20, then multiply it to the 12,000. So the order of which you do that is what you have to pay attention to. Look at 31, so thir yep. All right, so if you look at 31, now it says investing $12,000 at an annual rate of 3%, find the balance after five years compounded monthly. So your investment is still $12,000, one plus your rate is still 0 0.03. If it is monthly, how many times a year is that? 12. 12, and then it's raised to the 12 times T, which is five. So 12,000, oh, and if you do this, let me see. Okay, if you have a graphing utility or one that stores the whatever came before it, if you arrow up to that last one and you hit enter, it will duplicate it, so for the lazy folks, okay? You can come back in here and you can change this. Just be careful because the four would change to 12. As soon as you put the one, it's gonna overtake the four. If you hit insert, which is above the delete, so second insert, it gives you the space to put the two. And then it's four, and again, you can make that 12 times five in the, in the exponent, and then hit enter and you get your answer, okay? So especially on the homework tonight, you're gonna see you use the same information over and over again. It's a good little like time saver trick, or you could just rewrite it all, but that does work. So from here, I get that my investment would be $13,939.40.
Amanda. These numbers will be very similar, but, and also think about like, if you're only in there for five years and you're earning a, a like 3%, you're earning about $2,000 on that one. That should make sense. It should never jump from like $12,000 to like $128,000. Something's wrong there. Okay. And the number of times you compound as that increases, so does the money earned. So obviously if you're earning it daily, it's going to be more than if you were earning it quarterly. So those kind of things, like all those logic things should make sense when you're looking at your answers. All right. The last thing is what happens if it's compounded continuously and continuously is happening like every second. So like right now it just gave you 3%. And then in two seconds, it's giving you 3% on your old increased money. And then it's another 3%. Whereas monthly, it's like, let's say you make $3 every month, right? And you start with 10, that's a huge investment, but let's say you start with $10. And at the end of the month, you now have $13. Now you're making that percentage off of $13. So that's how often it's compounding. That's what compounding means. If it's happening continuously, it's more than you can even figure out. So that's the most amount you can compound. Like continuously is going to give you the most amount of money. And that's what we use the natural base for. So this formula is if it's continuous. It is called, we call it PERT, just so because it literally spells that. It is the principal balance times E raised to the rate times time. There is no N in this equation because the number of times a year is compounded. It's continuously. So again, it's PERT. So, and it says you invest $12,000 at an annual rate of 3%, find the balance after five years compounded continuously. That's the word you're looking for. A equals P times E to the RT. So $12,000 times E raised to the 0 0.03 times five. And then remember your E is above the LN button. So this would be 12,000 times E 0 0.05 or 0 0.03, sorry, times five in your exponent, and you should get $13,942.01. Always rounding to the nearest cent because it's money. So on WebAssign, you'll see it's like one big chart and it gives you the N. It says like number of times a year is once or twice or four times, whatever it is. In, um, on a quiz or a test, you would see it in words, like monthly, quarterly, weekly, that kind of stuff. So just make sure you would know how to find that. Questions?